Before making this video, I searched through a bunch of textbooks to try to find a good definition of experiment, but I find that they all sound pretty complicated. One said that an experiment is a research method in which an investigator manipulates one or more factors or independent variables to observe the effect on some behavior or mental process, the dependent variable. Another one said that an experiment is a, quote, carefully regulated procedure in which the researcher manipulates one or more variables that are believed to influence some other variable. Now, if these explanations make sense to you, awesome, go with that. But I find them to be a little bit complicated, so I'm going to try to break it down a little bit. When we study psychology, or, or any science really, what we want to know is how different things are related, how one thing can lead to another thing. I don't just want to know that people who get more sleep seem to get better grades. I want to be able to say with absolute certainty whether or not an increase in hours of sleep will cause an increase in student exam scores. And that's why experiments are so important. Because unlike other research methods like descriptional studies or correlational studies, which help to undercover naturally occurring relationships, experimental studies allow us to say something about causation. They help us isolate cause and effect. And I'm going to write that down. So cause and effect. Now, how do they do this? First of all, you're going to set up a situation. And this is important. What it means is that you, as an experimenter, are controlling a situation, or you're setting up a situation that you'll have complete control over. The second part is to manipulate one variable, or manipulate just one thing. The third step, which I guess is actually step two and a half, not really step three, but it's, it's keep everything else the same. So you run a situation where X thing is done A way, and then you set up another situation that's exactly the same as the first, where the X thing is run B way. And assuming that you've kept everything else exactly the same, then if you get different results between these situations, you can say that it is due to the manipulated variable. Because only the manipulated variable is what was changing. Only that manipulated variable could cause any differences between two situations if everything else was kept the same. To make this a little bit clearer, let's do an example. Let's say you wanted to look at whether or not consuming sugar leads kids to become distracted. So I start out with a hypothesis. I say that yes, I, I do believe that sugar will lead kids to be distracted and I come up with some experiment, and then I'm going to operationally define my variables in relation to that experiment. In this case, I'm going to set up a room in my lab with a computer. There's the screen. And on that computer is an extremely boring program, and, and all that program does is flashes letters on a screen, and the participant is asked to press a button whenever they see the letter X, but not when they see any other letters. And here I'll operationally define distraction as the number of times a participant misses an X. So the number of times that an X appears on the screen and the participant doesn't click a button. So I have my hypothesis, I have my, my situation set up, and I have full control over the situation. And now I want to talk about sugar. Now I want to talk about the variable that I'm manipulating. But it isn't enough to just bring participants into a lab and feed them sugar and see what happens because that wouldn't really tell me anything about cause and effect. Instead, I create a bunch of different groups. So let's say I'm going to have one group that has 10 grams of sugar, which is not a very large amount of sugar. And then I'll have another group that gets 40 grams of sugar, which is about how much sugar is in a can of soda. And then I'll have another group that has 80 grams of sugar, which is, which is quite a lot of sugar. Then I'll include one more group, and that group will get zero grams of sugar. They won't get any sugar at all. All right, so now I'm ready to run my study. So the first thing that will happen is that participants will come into the lab and I'm going to randomly assign them to one of my four conditions. And what does that mean? Well, it means that any kid who comes into my lab has an equal likelihood of being placed in each of these four conditions. And I do this to help to ensure that there aren't any differences between my group, or, or at least to help minimize any differences between my groups. And after they've been assigned to these groups, and their parents have signed consent forms, and they've signed assent forms, then we'll have them consume a pill with one of these different levels of sugar. So consume sugar. And yes, everyone will take a pill, even the people who are sorted into the zero gram condition. And this is to help minimize the placebo effect. 
which is the tendency for expectations to influence the outcomes of studies. My, my next step would be to wait a little bit until the sugar is digested. I'm not entirely sure how long it takes sugar to enter our bloodstream, but theoretically I've done a lot of background research, and so I'll, I'll know that before I go in, and I've already incorporated that into my study. For this case, let's say maybe it's 15 minutes. And after that, each child is asked to complete the incredibly boring task of clicking a button every time they see the letter X. So they'll have to play the, it's the worst video game ever. And they have to play it for a really long time, maybe, maybe 30 minutes, which is an incredibly long time if you're a kid. And after they're done, and the kid's probably a little bit angry, what we'll do is we'll, we'll debrief the parent, we'll debrief the kid, we'll tell them exactly what our study was actually about, and, and maybe we'll try to compensate the kid for his time a little bit. We'll, we'll maybe give him or her some kind of tiny stuffed animal or some other toy to try to make up for this horrible activity they've just spent a lot of time doing. Now that we've collected our data, and let's say we've collected data from a ton of different participants, now we can look to see whether or not there are any differences in the levels of distraction between our four groups. And remember, if our hypothesis is that consuming sugar leads kids to become distracted, we expect to see a very specific result. So let's draw a graph here to illustrate what that's going to be. And on my y-axis, I'll have the number of times that, they've, that they miss the x, that they don't click the button when, the, when an x appears on the screen. And on my x-axis, I'll have my different groups. So I'll have 0 grams, 10 grams, 40, and 80. And let's say that an x appeared on the screen 50 times over the course of that half hour. So there were theoretically 50 chances that they might have missed the x on the screen. So our 0 gram group, which is also called our control group, it tells us a baseline score. It tells us how many x's that a child would miss without any influence of sugar. And so because I have this group, I'll be able to compare the experimental groups or the groups that did get sugar to the control group to see how different the children in my experimental groups differ from the average child. So let's say children who consume zero grams of sugar, let's say they miss maybe about, maybe about 20 of the X's. And I apologize that I'm apparently incapable of drawing straight lines. And then maybe our our 10 gram group would have missed a few more X's, though though not a ton. Maybe they missed 25. And then our 40 gram group, well, maybe they missed even more. Maybe they missed 35 of the X's. And the 80 gram group, man, that's that's really terrible. They they missed 40 X's on average. So our 10 gram sugar group missed the least amount of X's, though still more than the no sugar condition. The 40 group missed more than the 10 gram group, and the 80 gram group, those kids missed more than all of them. So in this study, I would say that the kids were most distracted in the 80 gram sugar group. And just so we're clear, as always, I completely made up these numbers, so don't go and deny the kids that you babysit for cupcakes or anything else. This is just completely made up data. All right, so let's think about this graph for a bit. Now remember, the only thing that has changed between my groups is the level of sugar ingested by the child. Every other thing was kept the same. And so looking at this graph, not only can we say that sugar level and distraction level are related, we can also say, after we've run some statistical tests to make sure, that the increase in sugar caused the increase in level of distraction. And that is what makes experiments so important. If I'm only changing one thing, and I make sure that that is the only thing that is changing, then I'm able to say that any differences that I see between the different groups are the results of the thing that changed because the only thing that differed in my conditions was the amount of sugar that kids consumed, I can conclude that it's the sugar that made them distracted. But the point is that this is the power of experiments. I'm not just showing that two things are related, I'm able to say that one thing is causing another thing.